Farms. My name is Aislinn Campbell, of course, and back behind the screen back there is my podcasting partner, my life partner, all kinds of awesomeness. Hello. Joe Hilliard. And today it is April, which means that we are in the windy season. I mean, it's kind of always windy in South Texas on the coast, but uh, this is the extra windy season. So excuse the wind. We're going to do our best to kind of avoid that. And then we're going to spend some time making our way around the farm today because one of my favorite months of the entire year to see the beauty of a farm is April. All the flowers are popping, all of the insects are coming out. If there's any new babies or any new coupling going on, April is when it's happening. It's spring and there's lots going on. And in fact, there's lots of diversity going on at Freedom Harvest Farms. Now, over the past week, we've been talking about, or last week on to this week, we've been talking about the five principles of regenerative agriculture. On the podcast, Dinner Table Talks, it's been the Dinner Table Talk recently. Uh, we transitioned from the autoimmune protocol series and into what we felt like was, was a really natural transition uh, from the health of our bodies to the health of our land and the bridge to healing we feel is regenerative agriculture or regeneration the regeneration of the diversity and the life that we live inside of our bodies but also the life that exists inside of the land so what a great opportunity it is today to go on with that continued conversation of diversity and showing it off here at freedom harvest farms now diversity in opposition to the monoculture uh, corporate agriculture that we have all across this country and throughout the world for that matter um, that is actually right across the street from us very easy to see kind of on all sides of us you'll see lots of monoculture you won't see um, a lot of different colors you're seeing green now green is very beautiful it's I was driving um, over yesterday and we live this April is a beautiful time of year and we live in an area where this is the time of year when all of the fields are green. So at least it doesn't look like brown dead dirt this time of year, like it often does the most of the rest of the year. And of course, in all the highways and byways in Texas, we have a lot of beautiful wildflowers, thanks to folks that have understood the biodiversity, have understood the pollinators for many, many years, including Lady Bird Johnson. So let's get on that note of biodiversity. And Joe, just look around really quickly here. The grass hasn't been mowed in, a, you know, maybe two weeks, which means that it gives us the ability to kind of let the flowers pop out. These are dandelions, and then you see the vervain going down over there. Of course, you're also going to see, um, I always forget the name of that one little yellow wallflower over there, but you're going to see a lot of diversity out. Look across the, um, the orchard over there, the pasture, not the pasture, but, you know, orchard lands, the front yard basically. a little bit more diversity in the grass. This is one of the things that I talk about often throughout the year. If you just simply look down at our grass, you're going to see different types of growth happening all year long. Different types of plants are going to be germinating with different soil temperatures, different air temperatures, and then uh, different types of pests and diseases, diversity, are going to come through and knock them out so that you move on to the next season. For every season there is a change and there is a change of pests, there is a change of diseases, just like there's a change of wind, weather, climate, uh, weather, all of those types, sorry, uh, temperatures, all of those types of things are the same. Now, in terms of an annual vegetable garden, this would be the one where I would say I have the least diversity because it is my youngest garden. This is the garden that we prepared in January and just planted. But even as you look quickly at a, a garden that was, or a piece of dirt field that was just dirt brown not that many months ago, you can see now a lot of different types of diversity. I have here beans. Um, a pepper plant that's not loving this hard wind so much, but some marigolds that I popped in there with it, right? So I've got a pepper, marigolds, beans, and then you'll also see cucumbers coming up in here. Now you're going to also begin to see some of the weeds. I don't want these weeds to take over, so I'll be kind of slowly trick, uh, popping them out. But you're seeing a nice diversity here. Then also 
so I went in and put some little celosias in. I want different kinds of colors. I want all different types of root structures. All of these things are going to benefit. Marigolds have a different sort of chemical uh, output, the smell. Pyrethrin, you know pyrethrin as a, um, a chemical, a synthetic chemical that is used for pest control. Well, the, the pyrethrin was originally created from the natural pyrethrin that comes off of the marigolds. So the marigolds are pest inhibitors. So that alone, in addition to the color and the pollinators that they draw in. Now, while I'm going through this conversation, please, in this subject of diversity, please feel free to ask me any questions and generally ask me any questions about gardening as well. So you see the celosias, the peppers, the marigolds. You're also going to see um, that I popped in some nice sunflowers along the edge over here and then all the way down along the edge over there. You're going to see sunflowers, big, pretty, uh, one single stalk mammoth sunflowers, things like that, that are going to pop up on the edge and they're going to help by giving some shade this direction. And then, of course, another type of uh, diversity that's on a farm is going to be the birds. And the birds are going to come through and eat the seeds and um, and be drawn to the, the beetles and the bugs that are going to be nesting or hanging out in, whatever, hosted on the sunflowers, right? Aphids love to go to the, same, the sunflowers. So putting a diversity of different types of flowers and different types of annual vegetables means that you're going to not have an infestation of a, one issue that's going to cause problems across the board. That's what tends to happen in monoculture. Pestilence and famine and things like that actually over time, over all of time of agriculture, we have seen that those are more likely to occur in a non-diverse monoculture scene. Even if we're talking about humans in a non-diverse scene, when you have a, um, a specific type of virus that comes out, if everyone was exactly the same, it would strike the whole planet and it would knock everyone out. But of course, we're not the same. We have all different types of immune systems. We have all different types of uh, resiliences within our different streams of inheritance and things like that. Over here, you're going to see, uh, of course, these rows are peppers, cucumbers, beans, marigolds, radishes, all of that kind of stuff are growing on these rows. On this row is a very nice, what is often called the three sisters, with the squash that are coming in down here at the bottom. That's the bushing squash. And then I did go ahead and put in some sunflowers, like I mentioned. So you've got some sun, big sunflowers starting to come up along this row over here. And then I've got my corn in there, and then I've also got my beans. And so this is going to do some nice coverage and a nice uh, companion diversity of different types of plants. Things that will help here is that this heavy-duty wind that we're dealing with is going to um, knock the corn over. If I can keep the corn protected on the bottom, if I can keep their roots protected by other plants that are growing down around the bottom, it means the corn's going to have a better ability to stay upright in this wind that we deal with here in the spring. And then down there is the potatoes. There's not a lot of diversity in my potatoes because I'm going to have to, in a, in a month or so, dig them up completely. But when I go back in, I will go in and plant summer flowers and black-eyed peas and okra and things like that just to get something growing, just like I did in my backyard garden last year. Of course, we've got the vineyards and then a diverse amount of different types of trees. We're doing mulberry Also, a lot of diversity of different types of flowers that have come in over here and different types of things that I'm growing. Right here in this one little patch, you're going to see uh, some sweet alyssum. You're going to see some calendula flowers. You're going to see a few weeds. I've got a, um, what do you call this, some brassica broccoli or something like that. As you get into the warmer times of the years, the brassica don't, don't do as well. The insects will go after any plant that is um, struggling. 
So in the midst of it, I don't have a row of just this barren. I have all of these other things around it to keep the pest from just going, okay, now let me eat the next one. Okay, now let me eat the next one. Instead, they go, oh, there's nothing else over here. Let me move on to something else, right? Calendula, all different types of things in here. I have done some weeding down here. You can also see the, that I've got some beets going in over there or coming up over there and lots of different mixtures. Now, over here, this diversity is a flower patch or a hedgerow. Um, there's all kinds of different names. Farmscaping is what I've done here. And what this is gonna do with this variety, you see I've got Gallardia, different types of Gallardia flowers. I've got um, cilantro that's bolting. I've got some bachelor buttons. There's some primrose in here, lots of sunflowers, more bachelor buttons, all different types of flowers. There's even poppies further down that direction. And what that's gonna do is draw in all different types of birds, all different types of pollination, pollinators that are gonna wanna come to this garden. Uh, it's also gonna attract the pests over in this area so that they're not only hanging out in this area. One of the things that I've learned um, recently by watching where the primrose grows, that the flea bites are really attracted to the primrose. This is a nice little area right here where you can see bachelor buttons, gallardias, you can see poppies coming up over there and right in here, you know, come just popping through. And then you can see poppies are popping. <laughs> and then you can see all the different types of wallflowers over there. They're aesthetically pleasing. They're attractive to different types of, uh, of beneficial insects. And they're also uh, gonna attract some of the pests, right? I'd rather the pests eat on this stuff than be over here in this garden. But I also have a lot of diversity in this garden. You can see here, I've got peppers, different types of peppers, eggplants, still have some nice vervain flowers, other types of flowers that are kind of over here. The beans and the, and the basil and stuff will start to come up. You can see the beans here, sunflowers, and some of the basil that's going to start to pop up in this row. Well, I have a question. Shirt. Yes. Clearly it's a very windy day. Yes. The first garden that we looked at is brand new. Just uh, a couple months old. Yes. This one is two years old. Yes. Do you see a difference in the plant's ability to Absolutely. I guess uh, <laughs> yes. battle the wind yes in the more established garden? What I didn't show you over there is that my pepper plants do not look this healthy in that garden over there. They, and one of them doesn't even have any leaves on it. Because it's just and, wide open, and windy these plant. are actually with a lot of peppers already getting put on. Like here, look, every single one of these peppers, pepper plants has peppers already growing on it. Um, you know, bell, uh, banana peppers, Anaheim peppers, all of these plants. And they're not that much older. Which I guess is also an indication that uh, the two-year-old garden has biodiversity in the soil yes. uh, that, yes. helps, that helps as well but I was talking specifically about the ability to stand up to the hard wind yeah well different types of plants are gonna have yes so different types of plants are gonna uh, some taller plants are gonna block out the wind if you that direction, there's tall plants to cover the wind and to cover the plants to protect and protect the lower plants exactly okay. and then you also have different types of root structures different types of root structures and ground coverage will keep the plants' roots locked in better. That's when I mentioned that about the corn and the squash and the beans growing here. Speaking of corn, is that a single stalk of corn? No, that's um, a leek. Okay. It looks like a corn stalk. <laughs> no, it's kind of the same because it's got the flat leaves, but that's in the allium family. So you can see the, the, the all the different biodiversity going on in here. I've got nasturtium plants, I've got beans, I've got leeks. Onions are really good, or allium family plants are really good as a deterrent with the, the hormone smell that they give off. A lot of the insects don't like that smell, so I put that in here. Now, what you're seeing here is an annual perennial companioning garden. Annual and perennial means I've got the diversity of a plant that goes in, lives one year, produces its flowers, produces its fruits, dies out, and then can potentially come back the next year. And then I have the plants that are going to get knocked back and they're just going to come back after the freeze. They're going to live through the summer. They live year round. So there's a mixture of annual and perennial going on here. That's diversity of different varieties of plant life. Like the way plants live is even different. Okay. So then of course, you know that we have a lot of different types of animals out here. Um, our way to the back back there. Here's another uh, section. This is my sweet potato section. It's got some dill coming up over there and, uh, and then it's also got some okra coming up on top of it and then it's also laying the sunflowers. That's just going to take over a bit. That's why it looks like barren right now. And then a mixture of lettuce, spinach, and nasturtium. Here's a calendula flower. 
camera that's about to pop. That's kind of new. And then basil, uh, also uh, beets. You see um, uh, coriander or cilantro. Different types of flowers. All different types of bushes. Uh, um, you're going to see Turk's cap in my backyard, sunflowers in my backyard, you see sage plants, all different types of um, perennials mixed with, look, check this out. This is a native um, coffee. It's a perennial, uh, it's, a, it's the um, prairie nymph, um, also known as her herbertia. And then look right here, lots of little ladybugs. You're getting to see a lot of diversity. Here's some clover around that. Here's another different type of wildflower. I don't know what variety this is, but. But you enjoy seeing those in just kind of your weedy grass. Well, yes, I want all flowers. I've got bees at the back, right? So here's some another diversity in regenerative agriculture. We're doing our part to add diversity. We're not just doing one type of crop, corn, or one type of crop, black eyed peas, or one type of animal, uh, cattle. We're doing ducks and chickens, and we've got pigs, and we've got longhorn steers, and we've got sheep, and then we've got all different types of flowers, and we're growing different types of um, companioning things that are all coming together so we have a nice diversity on our land. There's the steers right there out at the pond. And the sheep were up this morning and the ducks were up this morning. Of course, we've also got skunks. I literally saw a skunk yesterday morning. We have cardinals and all different types of varieties of birds. We had a hawk this winter that made our, our home his home this winter. Even in my and in my like landscaping areas i'm putting in edibles and i'm putting in mixtures of different varieties that draw in the hummingbirds all of my flowers in my my flower garden over there all those red salvia flowers the hummingbirds love it i've got like four or five hummingbirds that live around that area and hang are hanging out around that tree over there and hanging out around that garden because of the flowers they love so much i remember before i knew all of the words you know yes by listening to you uh, week after week, uh, when we were in the backyard at the house in town, the first thing I did to help increase that biodiversity was begin bringing birds into the backyard with different, you know, bird watching and bird feeding techniques. Right. So, um, that's then an, of course... That's a fun and easy one to do. Yeah, and so, of course, we've always had the chickens and back in the backyard. That was one of the first things. It's funny because someone asked me the other day when they came for a tour, they, were, they said, which comes first, the chicken or the garden? And I said, the chickens. The chickens I hear are the gateway drug to a good gardening. Um, I was always a gardener, and, but for us to really get, uh, uh, to really kick off our home gardening, it took getting the um, chickens in place. And once we got the chickens in place, then I, I started maneuvering everything else. So I think about where do my chickens go first and then grow my gardens past that. But it's always about the diversity I have to have those chickens. We moved the chickens. They were over here in their chicken tractor. You know, we that tunnel. Sorry, that little uh, hoop. Quonset. Quonset, yeah. if you will. Then some tunnels that come out and they go down the rows. Well, that was here, and then we just moved it over to my flower garden, pumpkin garden, because there's lots of diversity of things for them to eat on over there. They've been over here. They've had this type of grass. They've had the insects that are mostly invading over here. So let me move them over there. That means they're going to be healthier and the food that they give us is going to be healthier. That means that I'm going to be healthier because everything that I'm eating is going to be more nutrient dense. When there's diversity on the land with these regenerative principles, we're creating more nutrient dense foods. This is an extremely important part as we go back to the podcast, the autoimmune, pro the auto reason I'm doing the autoimmune protocol diet, dealing with autoimmune disorders is that 
we're not eating enough nutrient dense food. So food that's grown on monoculture fields that are grown in this system that is, um, and it's a system, it's a system of this particular type of seed, this particular type of weed killer, the only these plants, these types, doing it this order, this amount of time, this amount of fertilizer, exactly everything the same. Not only is it monoculture, but it's treated as if it's a, um, it's a widget, like a, like a machine process, rather than gardening or farming, which is what it is when you have diversity. here but I needed them to be cleared out because I'm gonna put my roselle in there. Roselle is a really good um, plant that can handle the summertime and then at the beginning of the fall I'm gonna start being able to harvest the roselle calyxes. It's gonna be making me some beautiful tea to drink. Uh, it's also gonna be making some nice roselle jam that everyone likes. It's got a tart flavor kind of like cranberry. Rose similar to cotton, okra, hibiscus. If you've ever drank the hibiscus tea, that red tea, that you're. So I'm going to go ahead and get that planted, but when I plant that, I'm also going to plant a lot of flowers down the bottom and other things that will grow to cover up this dirt because I don't want this dirt to be bare anymore after this season. I want this dirt to stay with something growing on it. The challenging part is the chickens can pick their heads through. So they keep it pet all the way to the edge, which is why we came out. About six over. inches out from the fence. Yeah, so they keep that edge cleaned up for us over there. Um, but you can see the diversity of this uh, This garden is one year old. So in one year, that garden that you saw at the very beginning of the video should look like this. It should have a diverse, large crop of stuff growing and not have a lot of, um, of just dirt showing and only a few plants. Some of the places where you can see just what you're really showing is new areas that we've just put in. So it'll take time for that to get going. But I've noticed here that I've already started to planted on purpose. So you can see here I've got a mortgage lifter tomato, I've got an eggplant, and I've got a beefsteak tomato over there. There's some sunflowers and some flowers and some lettuce and some onions, but then coming back down over here you can see the radishes that are coming out. You're also going to be able to see some of the little flowers that are going to start coming through. And of course weeds are going to set in as well because that's what's what's happening. And it happens all you know, trim the sunflowers up so they grow tall. If I have too, too many sunflowers, I manage that, but I don't get in a huff about it because it's all biodiversity. It's shade is going to help my shade my plants when the taller plants grow up. I can get plants growing, growing that are going to be fast growing and then other plants that are going to come up underneath them that are going to be a little bit more tender or gentle. They're going to be protected by all that other coverage. So, of course, there's lots of other types of diversity that come in. Put in topsoil, cow manure compost, sand, and then we put our wood mulch around it or maybe even tree leaf mulch. I want to talk a little bit about the mulching side of things because you don't have to use wood chip mulch. Wood chip mulch is, in, is valuable and important because it really helps to um, make sure you have a lot of mycorrhizal fungi or mycelium, another diversity in the soil. Of course, also diversity in the soil is going to be the grubs. Yes, the grubs that eat things, dig those grubs out and let them throw them to your chickens. The earthworms that are going to be underneath there and then all the different microbiome, microbiome, micro stuff that's underneath there, microbiology that's going on underneath the soil. So there's there's diversity on the top and the bottom and, it's, and you're not trying to kill everything. And every single time you go in with a, uh, with a um, pesticide, and understand, a lot of people ask me, what do you use to kill blah, blah, blah. I don't. I don't use pesticides. I am very particular about very particular pesticide I use for fire ants. That's really the only pesticide I use. I don't use pesticides because even an organic pesticide kills your diversity. And you don't want to kill your diversity. Regenerative agriculture is the answer to the future. It's the answer to a lot of the climate change issues we've been dealing with. It's the answer to nutrient-dense foods and to healing our own microbiome. 
It's the answer to a lot of things. It's certainly the answer to an uh, easier way of life, a more enjoyable way of life, and a pro more profitable way of farming if farming is your interest. And it's also uh, a way to support the whole environmental system that we're trying to work to, to create. So whether you're doing an actual full-scale garden, whether you're doing a small raised bed garden, Keeping, bio, keeping the diversity on your land is essential for everything. It's going to keep your soil healthier because the, the more diversity, the plants get hit different by the wind, by the rain, by the heat, by the uh, freezes. Everything that happens in the weather, your land will be treated differently. The runoff will be different. So things that run off of your property into our bays and estuaries and all different kinds of things like that are going to be less affected. By, uh, by the things because we've done regenerative agriculture and then of course the health of our bodies is also going to be better because of that across the board. We're also going to deal with cooler temperatures in the summertime and warmer temperatures in the wintertime because different types of plants can hold and emit different types of um, uh, temperatures for us. Shade trees, big nice trees, different types of plants have different abilities to um, do different work in in your gardens. I've talked about that over the types of the weeks. Like um, a mesquite tree and a wheatsatch trees are actually nitrogen fixing plants. So our blue bonnets, so our um, clovers, calcium fixing plants are dandelions. Every plant has a different ability to actually draw in and mine different types of minerals. So all of the things I've talked about today are just some of the biodiversity that we have here at Freedom Harvest Farms. If you've got some really uh, a nice array of biodiversity drop some in the comments tell me a few things that you have on your piece of land your dogs your cats your your possums <laughs> whatever you have on your property maybe you have a farm and you have a large bunch of different types of varieties of animals tell me the diversity that you're growing on your land and then tell me some of the diversity that you're hoping to put in like new fig trees all right that's all i have today thank you very much for joining me um Please feel free to come out on Mondays. The farm is open. I am here. We're doing garden healing in the mornings and garden healing in the afternoons. I have a class coming up on April the 29th. If you're interested in that, just send me a DM and I'll send you the link to that. And then also know that I am doing private hands-on uh, garden help with you in your garden, two hours for $77. Also, don't forget to check out the podcast, dinnertabletalks.com, or go over to my YouTube channel. You'll get it catch up there each week as well. Have a great day. Have a great Sunday. I love you, and I'll see you very soon.